Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Ryan Ahmed of the 41st District in Lancaster County. The issue that my constituents discuss with me the most is school property taxes. For decades, it has been discussed in Harrisburg with little true progress being made. Currently, two plans have been introduced in the State House seeking to replace property taxes with various sales and income taxes. One would eliminate the property tax statewide, and the other would allow the decision to be made at the local level. In an effort to inform our neighbors about the details of these two plans, Representative Brian Cutler and I co-hosted a forum with the architects of these two plans. They explained the details of their ideas and took questions from the audience. For those who are unable to attend, I'd like to share portions of this forum with you now. We have two uh, important pieces of legislation that have been recently introduced in the Pennsylvania House. Uh, Representative Jim Cox's House Bill 1776 and Representative Seth Grove's House Bill 2230. Representative Cutler and I wanted to bring them here to you for you to have an opportunity to hear more about both plans, uh, to provide questions, and uh, hopefully to later provide feedback uh, to, to Representative Cutler or myself. I'm going to yield now to my colleague, uh, Representative Brian Cutler. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us here this evening. Uh, I get the job of introducing our other two colleagues as they're going to head into the explanations of both of their plans. I think it's very important uh, that they were able to come down here because this has certainly been an issue uh, for even predates my tenure. I say my entire tenure of five years thus far, but it, it's uh, as you will hear as they run through the history and some of the background on their, their individual ideas and plans, it's been around for much, much longer than that. Um, one of the things that I did want to highlight, uh, because I did see uh, Mayor Gray walk into the room, uh, I want to contrast Lancaster City with Solanco School District. And you're not going to hear this very often, but one of the problems with property taxes is there's this assumption that there's actually a, a, a robust tax base in order to levy that tax against. And Lancaster City, they have an issue uh, where they have a lot of nonprofits, hospitals, schools, colleges, a lot of the, the 501c3 charitable organizations that have a multitude of good charitable missions. And by virtue of being nonprofits, uh, that means that their property parcels are not taxable. In Solanco, we have an interesting similarity. And that is that we have a, high, a disproportionately high number of properties that are enrolled in clean and green. Uh, we each lose approximately one-third of our property tax base to either tax exemption or tax deferral. And the effects on all of the other properties because of that are significant. Uh, where you're talking about a significant increase. Um, I do have the spreadsheets at the office. I'd be happy to share them. Uh, the numbers are, are fascinating. Solanco School District loses uh, about 34 to 35 percent of their tax base. Lancaster City is a close second with about 32 to 33 uh, percent of their tax base. And that's why this is such a problem. And we further compound it from Harrisburg because we don't fund the schools equitably to begin with. Now that's a, a separate debate that we're not going to get into tonight. But the property tax base is actually what highlights that problem, unfortunately. So with that, I'll, I'll yield the floor to Representative Cox and thank him for his time. Thanks for making the drive down from Berks County. So, thank you. The idea I'm going to present to you is not my original idea. The concept remains the same. We will be moving away from the school property tax as the primary source of funding for, for schools, and we'll be shifting that to a sales tax and an income tax. It's a blend of the two, and I'll describe more about that in a moment. But I wanted to give you a little bit of the background of why I'm doing this. I think it's nearly a criminal act for us to be, as a government body, sanctioning the taking of property because an individual can't afford to pay his property taxes. I don't think any of you in here would question whether we need to fund our schools at a decent level, but the way it's being done, it's just not working. And so regardless of whether you look at the approach that I'm offering tonight or the approach that Representative Grove is offering tonight, Regardless of how we approach this, 
I think we share the common goal, and that's to make sure that the schools retain the funding they need. One approach, 1776, the bill I'll be talking about is a statewide approach. He'll be talking about more of a localized approach. And clearly there's an appetite in the House of Representatives for both. Some will say, I like the, the local approach, it gives us more, more control on the local level, more options. Others look and say, that's not enough. And so the same dialogue we'll be having here tonight, hopefully we'll be having over the course of the next several months in the legislature in order to move property tax relief or property tax replacement along the road. I will be fighting like mad to make sure it's property tax replacement. Um, and I know, thank you. The way we acquire the funding for House Bill 1776 and the replacement of the school property taxes is by increasing the personal income tax. Right now, we're currently paying a rate of 3.07. Under this approach, that personal income tax rate would move to just over 4%. 4.01 uh, is the number that we've calculated out. We're going to be increasing the sales tax from 6% to 7% on all of the items you're currently paying sales tax on. And so, a lot of people look at that and say, that's no big deal. Where we find the kicker, if you will, is when we start talking about expansion right. of the sales tax base. The sales tax expansion makes people nervous because of the types of things we're looking at taxing. Uh, the largest source of revenue within the sales tax expansion is in fact a tax on services. We're not taxing all services. We're trying to carve out business to business transactions to make sure that the cost of your goods and your services at the end aren't increased uh, with what economic modeling calls pyramiding, which means if you're a business, right now if you're a business, you buy paper and you're going to print stationery on it, you're not paying a sales tax on that paper when you purchase it from the supplier. An individual who buys stationery may perhaps pay sales tax at the final consumer end of things. And so our goal is to avoid putting a tax on goods or services in the various stages of the production of that good or a service. And so with that in mind, we tried to avoid a pyramiding situation. Brian talked about uh, how this plan was different, how this approach was different. And so while that basic concept is the same of replacing school property taxes with a sales tax and income tax increase and the expansion of the sales tax, there are two significant changes. And I'll summarize them this way. Number one, we're not taking on the debt of school districts around the Commonwealth. Number two, we're not determining a new funding formula for how this money goes back out to the schools. Those are the two most significant changes. There are other changes throughout the bill, but those are the two significant changes that I feel have allowed me uh, and others like Brian and, and, and uh, Representative Almond to go out there and bring additional co-sponsors on. We had 42 co-sponsors was the high watermark for previous versions of this, of this approach. We have 70 co-sponsors as I stand here tonight. There's significant interest in this. Let me explain the debt side of things. People have said, you know, you're being disingenuous by talking about property tax replacement and property tax elimination. You're not really getting rid of it all. On one level, that's true. But on another level, they're leaving something significant out. The average statewide debt service that is held by your school district, and it may be different within the school districts represented here tonight, but statewide, 10% of a school district's budget goes toward paying off debt service. And so if we leave property taxes alone at the level that a school district would need to pay for their debt service, most of you would probably receive about a 90% reduction, which is near elimination. In the first full year of implementation, you'd receive about a 90% reduction in your school property taxes. There's about 15 school districts around the Commonwealth that don't have any debt service, so they'd see full elimination 
right off the bat. Now, some have said, oh, you know, some people are going to be paying property taxes for 30 years. That's true, but they'll be paying 10% of their school property taxes for 30 years. And then the authority of the school district to levy property taxes expires. The, the second significant thing was the funding provisions. A lot of people, as I, as I walked around talking to them about this, and I spent the better part of 2011, people asked, when are you going to introduce? And that was a common question I got, especially in my district. They asked, why don't you just introduce the previous version? Why don't... And I answered them with a quote from Einstein. Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And so I knew some changes had to be made to the previous legislation. I knew we couldn't just take the bill and reintroduce it, you know, get a bunch of co-sponsors and hope for the best. I wanted to make some changes that would respond to the people in the House that I was speaking with. People had different ideas of what a funding formula should look like. And I found pretty quickly on that I wasn't going to be able to find a funding formula that made everyone happy. And so rather than making the debate about House Bill 1776 be about whether they like a particular funding formula or a certain element of the bill, I just pulled it out altogether. And there's no funding formula. And you may ask, well, how in the world does the money get back to the schools? It's as simple as this. If your school district is collecting $100 million under school property taxes, if they're collecting $100 million under school property taxes, upon full implementation of House Bill 1776, your school district would still receive $100 million. We wouldn't be looking at all the ins and outs of, of population changes and everything else like that, but for that first full year, they get exactly what they would have gotten under their school property taxes. So what do we do in the, in the years beyond that? That's up to me and these other fine gentlemen up here and what the legislature comes up with. The legislation, 1776, calls for the legislature to come up with a funding formula that adequately addresses the concerns about how money should be driven out. The place for the discussion, though, is not in House Bill 1776. I wanted this bill to be about replacing the school property tax with the sales and income tax. It's as simple as that. That's, those are the changes that need to be discussed. Do we want to swap revenues? And so if you have any questions about it, I'm sure Representative Cutler and Representative Allman would be happy to field those. And if they don't have the answers and uh, can't understand the crazy legislation I put together, I'm sure they'll talk to me about it and we'll get you some answers. But I appreciate your, uh, your attendance tonight and your interest in this issue. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Representative Cox. So with that, I'll introduce Representative uh, Seth Grove. Seth's from across the county, York County, uh, and he has more of what I would term the local option. He's in the middle of his second term. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Good evening. My tact with, with property taxes came back um, during some analysis. I mean, this was um, obviously my fourth year in the legislature uh, for two about two of them. Um, I just sat crunching numbers, um, running through data sheets, spreadsheets, uh, looking at statewide tax shifts. And then it dawned on me through two statistics. One, I was there probably it was about 4 a.m. I was looking at the, uh, uh, we don't tax other tobacco products, would be snuff and um, chew tobacco and stuff like that. I'm looking through this data, um, analyzing who would vote for who wasn't, what were the issues with bringing that in. It's about, you know, about $70 million that you could uh, maybe used for property tax relief. And I had my, my local um, taxing folder beside me and kind of going through local taxes. And, you know, property tax is a local tax. It's assessed on for by school districts, cities, counties, all these local government entities. And then it hit me. We're using statewide taxes to reduce local property taxes. And the numbers never worked legislatively through the General Assembly because there's not enough votes to do it. Why is that? Uh, when I looked at total statewide collections, uh, for the entire state of Pennsylvania, there are nine counties, nine counties that make up 70% of the total school property taxes collected in this state. Nine counties out of 67. Um, when you look at that mass in those areas, Lancaster, Berks, York, we're part of those nine. Where are you going to get the votes from those other 
58 counties that are going to say, you know what, raise my taxes to relieve the property tax burden in those nine other counties. I don't know a legislator alive that would say today, if your colleagues say, you know what, Philadelphia is having a hard time. I need to raise your taxes for them to go build a new stadium. Brian and Brian would not be here. I would not be here in, in, in my district if, if I made those suggestions. And that's the reality. That's what we, 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 we divide with. Uh, the, the other aspect is I don't want to come back and revisit property taxes. Uh, we've been dis discussing it in the legislature longer than I've been alive. Um, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to hold property tax meetings. I don't want to discuss it anymore. I want the whole kit and caboodle, just not school property taxes. I want county property taxes. I want city county or city taxes. I want all local government taxes, townships, you name it. I want to do away with all of them. So I devised a plan, similar, sales tax, income tax. Those are the two taxes that you have that bring up enough revenue to really do anything uh, to, to, to mitigate the billions of dollars in, in property taxes that we have in this state. Um, my plan is two prongs. It's an income tax and a sales tax shift. I will handle the income tax first. Number one, it allows all local governments, counties, cities, school districts, all of them, to eliminate property taxes through an earned income or, or a personal income tax. Uh, minimum 30% reduction all the way to elimination. Let's say a, a local school district says, you know what, we're going to do 30% for now. Their millage rates are frozen at 30%. They can't raise them anymore. You're now locked out. No more, no more millage rates, no more property taxes, no more increases. You get an equal dollar for dollar shift in either earned income tax or per personal income tax um, as, as the increase. For more revenue, it would allow those local governments to increase their income tax rates based on the rate of inflation. Rate of inflation. Uh, what that does is, because property tax is a stagnant tax, it doesn't naturally grow with the economy. So when local governments are looking just to do inflationary increase, they need to increase the rates on property taxes. That's why property taxes go up every single year. There's no inflationary increase with that unless counties do a reassessment or if uh, you have a huge farm that's now converted into multiple homes and the assessment value of those properties increase. Income tax and sales tax naturally grow with the economy. People get more money through wage increases. People make more money on profits. That way you have a natural increase that mitigates the need to actually ever really increase taxes um, until obviously down economies, there's some fluctuation with those two taxes and that brings local governments back to the whole don't eliminate our property taxes because they don't influx with the, with the uh, economy. So it's considered a safe tax. Now the sales tax comes in as a local option. Um, it allows every county, uh, excluding Philadelphia, to put on the ballot a 1% sales tax for their county. If the voters approve it, it would go to reduce school district millage rates. So if your schools implement the income tax aspect, and let's say they don't eliminate, it's just 50%. They would see a 50% reduction in your school property taxes, an increase in your, in your income tax, and then the sales tax would reduce your millage rates more and continue to reduce your millage rates. The sales tax can only be used for tax increases if, you, if, you, if school districts eliminate their property taxes and then it, it can only go to other tax decreases. It cannot be used for new spending. So it mitigates the, the, the it continually drives down that millage rate for school districts. It also allows all local governments, cities who are struggling, third class cities. We have one in New York City. They are struggling. Our, York City as a whole, the residents saw a 34% increase in their property taxes last year. 17% from the city, 17% from the school districts. That's unsustainable long term. There is no entity out there that can uh, have 34% increase on taxes long term. Um, we will see more third class cities going to bankruptcy because it scares away your tax base. Who wants to live there? I talked to uh, a city council member in New York City. Um, we, had, we pay the same in property taxes, but his house is assessed at a third the cost, a third of the cost. Um, nobody wants to live in those areas. And that's what's really going to save our third class cities and, and those struggling communities is shifting the tax base away from property tax and get home ownership uh, back into those areas. If you have home ownership, you have strong, vibrant communities. So I deliberately de devised this plan to, to get around what is traditionally the, the political um, headaches with, with doing statewide property tax. Number one, it's local. There's no distribution that uh, will throw you off. It's not, you know, Elk County, I want Elk County to fund for us. It maintains it local. It deals with all local governments. 
Uh, even if you deal with school property taxes, you're coming around again to take another bite at the apple at other local government entities. And it's critical we give them the tools to deal with it. We have 67 counties, 500 school districts, and over 22,500 local municipalities. One size fits all solution does not work for all of them. And that's why you need to give all those local governments the tools they need to deal with their local tax base. It's effective, good public policy. It can garnish the votes to get out. It mitigates the concerns of all areas and it ensures that our local governments will thrive for years to come and doesn't involve state takeover of, of really entity. Um, with that, um, I'm kind of done. Short, sweet, to the point. I'm more of a realistic, throw it out there and get it done kind of guy. So I will turn it over to any questions and uh, appreciate uh, the ability to come here. And uh, I will save my Go Revolutions uh, speech for afterwards for you baseball fans. <laughs> All right, let's try to go quick fire here as quickly as we can. Try to get through as many questions. So I ask the members to be as brief as, uh, as you can with the answer, but to, to answer uh, um, as succinctly as possible here. Do either of you believe you'll be looking at either House Bill 1776 or House Bill 2230 five years from now? <laughs> as in it's not done and signed into law? Yes. OK. Um, I think, I personally think the, the best option to get anything through the General Assembly is local option. That's why I introduced it. I refuse to let this issue keep percolating. I want solutions. I'm a solution driven guy. I want fruition. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm done with it. And uh, I want the kit and caboodle. That's, that's, that's what we need to drive home. Um, I'm at the point where um, anything goes. Um, but I want, want to set something up that has the best chance of succeeding to provide relief elimination that I think the general public, especially in, in, in the core counties in South Central Pennsylvania, have. Um, I am very confident my bill is uh, out of um, um, finance committee. It is positioned on the House floor and uh, working with my colleagues to, to tweak it a little bit. Answer the question, uh, do I plan on looking at this in, in five years? Brian said it best, I hope not. Um, my commitment, though, is, and I think we've got more momentum now than we've ever had. Uh, as I mentioned, 42 co-sponsors was the high water mark. Uh, 74 votes was the highest number of votes any previous version of property tax replacement. That's the highest number of votes it ever got. I have 70 co-sponsors. And I have a large number of people that said, look, I can't co-sponsor it for this reason or that reason, or I'm not quite sure I want to co-sponsor it. However, I will vote for it when it comes to the floor. And so I'm in the process of tallying up those types of individuals who can't bring themselves to co-sponsor or are not quite comfortable with all the details of it yet. I'm in the process of tallying up votes there, uh, and I'm working on getting the bill out of committee. My bill was introduced a little bit later than, than Seth, so I'm a little bit less further down the road than he is. Uh, but I'm looking at getting out of finance committee in the coming weeks and uh, also moving to see if we can get a vote on the House floor soon. But my commitment is property tax elimination, and like I said, I think we've got the momentum now uh, that we've never had before. And we all, we all need your support uh, to get either one of these plans done. So whichever one you're behind, uh, let your voice be heard. For both uh, Representative Grove and Representative Cox in regards to your proposals, what is to prevent uh, an ever-increasing sales tax or an ever-increasing income tax. If the transition is made to sales or income, um, was to prevent the same concern that folks have with ever-increasing uh, continuing to uh, property taxes that continue to increase. Um, with mine, the the one percent county option sales tax, um, they would actually need to go back in and change the law and then revote it. So the one percent sales tax is is capped at that much. You, you'll never be able to raise that rate unless you do uh, legislative changes. Um, the income tax uh, goes back to local governments and their decisions. Um, they would be able to increase um, the income tax rates up to the rate of inflation, and that's it. Um, no referendum, no nothing. It's up to the rate of, of inflation. But because you have income tax and sales tax, both uh, that increase with, with the economy, with inflation, um, it takes the need to raise taxes, um, the, the need to do that. I want to encourage you, get involved. We're going to do what we can to address the problem on the statewide level. 
but you have got to get in there and fight in the meantime to do what you can do on the local level. There's a lot of power on the local level, and you can get in there and make changes. Find out who's running for school board. Ask them the question that's most important to you. If you're here tonight, that question probably would go something like, what's your view on increasing property taxes versus controlling school spending? Under either one of your plans, would tax-exempt organizations or charitable organizations pay sales tax? No, it would, uh, I know under mine it would follow the same um, tax rules as we already have in place. We follow the same tax rules as well. Uh, the goal is not to, I honestly believe nonprofits are supposed to do more of what government is already doing. Uh, if our nonprofits, churches, food banks, etc., if we create additional barriers for nonprofits and other similar organizations by putting a sales tax in place, we further burden our systems like the welfare system and so forth. So uh, I, I maintain those exemptions and in fact would love to see the abilities of, of uh, nonprofits expand. Have you considered elimination of the assessment-based property tax as it can never be applied fairly and replacing it rather with a realty transfer tax, which is always based upon a known market value, which is set at the time of sale. Uh, it can be amortized over the length of the mortgage and eliminates constraints to property improvements and eliminates the cost of reassessments that are borne by the local authorities. Realty transfer tax essentially occurs uh, when a property is purchased. Uh, typically, 2%. it's 2%. 1% goes to the state, 1% stays local. And ideally, that's something that is supposed to go to the state's coffers, uh, supposed to supplement uh, our, our general fund. Unfortunately, when we looked at uh, earlier versions where the realty transfer tax was actually increased, and again, property taxes would have been eliminated completely, but that realty transfer tax increase was enough of an increase and was significant enough that the realtors came out in droves and just killed it on that. And so a lot of the people uh, who talked about it uh, and voted against it when it was an amendment uh, back in 2008, they didn't like the realty transfer tax side of things. And so we have done everything in 1776, everything possible that would allow us to encourage home ownership. And so if we were to utilize a realty transfer tax, you know, we're taking a chunk of, of money away uh, for uh, school property taxes, but then we're adding a number back, sometimes a significant amount of money back in a realty transfer tax. And so the goal here is to encourage, especially in this economy with the housing market like it is, we want to encourage property ownership on all levels. I want to personally thank uh, Representative Cox and, and Representative Grove for making the journey down here. I know it's it's late and they both have young families and I appreciate them taking time out of their evening to kind of come and explain their plan because I think as, as you saw, it, it's not a simple open and shut case as far as some of the dynamics that we have to deal with with our colleagues when it comes to the issue of property taxes. Uh, so I appreciate the history, I appreciate uh, both your efforts and I appreciate everyone's time, uh, so thank you. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Ryan Ahmed. If you have questions about these property tax bills, please feel free to contact me at my local office or through my website. The information will be shown in a moment. In addition, the contact information for Representative Cutler will be shown as well. Thanks for watching and please join me next time for Legislative Review.